Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Christian Schalk from Front in Germany. After his medical school in Freiburg, Germany, Dr. Schalk completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Subsequently, he completed an elbow fellowship under the German Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. And he's a member of the German and European Society for Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. He's also a committee member for the rehabilitation section at the German Society of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. Dr. Schauk is board certified under the German Shoulder and Elbow Society and is also instructor for AGA, which is a society for arthroscopy and joint surgery in Germany. He specialized in shoulder and elbow surgery since 2012 and currently serves as the head of the German Shoulder and Elbow Clinic. He has several peer-reviewed articles on shoulder arthroplasty, more than 10 book chapters on elbow surgery, and more than 20 articles on elbow surgery, and has delivered more than 150 talks on shoulder and elbow surgery worldwide. If you've noticed, Dr. Shock has delivered a lecture on our channel, which has already reached to a huge audience. And today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Christian Shock for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, for this nice and kind introduction. Um, I hope to get it started right now. Yes. I'm happy to be here having a talk with you. Just should switch right now. This is my this is disclosures. My disclosures, although I don't have any disclosures for this uh, special topic. Mm -hmm. So let us start with some facts and figures. There's quite high incidence and prevalence of epicondylitis. If you had medial and lateral epicondylitis, it's about 10 to 20% of incidence and 1 to 6% prevalence. Uh, in German and European countries, it's um, seven to one for radial versus ulnar epicondylopathy. Um, it's gender neutral, so male and female are equal. It's in three quarters the dominant arm which is hit. It's usually striking patients between 40 to 55 years. You've got two types of patients, the left one, obese, nicotine abuser, or the right one, just hard uh, worker or heavy loader in sports. So if you load more than five kilograms over two hours per day or 10 times 10 kilograms, you have a risk factor for this. And the good news is it's self-limiting in 90, up to 90% of the patients, no matter which conservative treatment we take, but it takes up to one year if you don't take any um, conservative treatment, so you can fasten it up by conservative treatment. What do we know about the pathogenesis of epicondylopathy? There are some models out there. That's the most recent model from uh, Co et al. from 2011. So it's about mechanical factors, repetitive stress, or so me mechanical loads, excessive loads, contusions. And on the other hand, there are structural factors like cellular and metabolic uh, failure. Both are leading to fibrillar ruptures and around matrix lesions, which are leading to a reactive tendinopathy, as everywhere, not only on the extensors. And then we've got uh, two options. We've got more or less more excessive load and tendon disrepair, so we get to more tendon degeneration and sometimes to a rupture of the tendon. And sometimes there's some clinical healing without having a better way of degenerative tendinopathy than it happened, but it's not getting worse, so the clinical healing is point we want to get. On the other hand, there's, we can optimize the load, we can get regeneration and adaption of the tendon, we can get or achieve anatomical healing and strengthening, so it's clinically and anatomically healed, so that's the best way to treat or to get a tendinopathy well. That's the same idea, but more or less in a time frame, so it starts with an insertional tendinopathy, goes over to highly degeneration and edema of the tendon, which can be solved by healing response. At some point, we've got a point of no return with granulation tissue and calcifications, maybe partial tears of the tendons and tissue necrosis, so we tend to disrepair, so we end up in failed healing and painful patients. What do we find in histology? There are microscopic findings with uh, thinner torn and collagen fibers. We have the loss of a classical hierarchical tendon structure, so the 
the longitudinal structure is torn and they're getting more or less in every way. Uh, it's an uh, abnormal amount of collagen-3 with increased concentrations of glucosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. So it's a chondrogenic dysplasia and uh, oxidative stress and neovascularization. And we get an angiofibroblastic hyperplasia. We find an upregulation of inflammatory mediated substances like interleukins or PCE or substance P or COX2 or metalloproteinases and catecholamines, but we don't find inflammatory cells. So it's better to get a mechanotransduction we are talking about for the healing. So the reaction of the mesenchymal stem cells to mechanical stimulation is the transduction. This is what we need for high healing. On the, on the elbow, we find two hypervascularized zones. So there are zones of predilection for um, bad healing. So there's the first zone is two, two to three centimeters distal from the lepi lateral epicondyle in the deep layer of the tendon. On the other side, there is a, a proximal lateral epicondyle and the distal supracondylar ridge, or the so-called trista supi, supracondylaris, which is with only a few um, vessels. So this is the predilection for not healing. So this is what we can take into um, recognition for our clinical testing or operative uh, ideas. How do we clinical testing? I think uh, the clinical tests for the tennis elbow are common and well known. There's the first, the local pain. If you press on the epicondyle and it's painful there, so it's for, the, for most of the patients, epicondylitis. If you have a positive Thompson test or a Mills test or the Cosin test, which are all provoking the extensor groups and testing the strength or the, the, the pain in, in testing the strength, then you get a positive testing for um, tennis elbow. There are a few other tests like the middle finger extension test for the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And there's the, in Germany, we, we call it Koenig test or it's the snapping with the fingers. So if you do this and it's painful, you are suspect for having an epicondylitis. And you've got the chair test, that means you lift the ch a chair on his back uh, just in front of you. And if it's painful, you've got a positive chair test and uh, suspect, you are a suspect for uh, epicondylitis. It's not only testing epicondylitis tests, but you should do some, some other tests on the elbow. There are tests for the instability. So in, on the radial side, it's a, for postulateral rotatory instability or PLRI. So there's a posterior lateral draw you can take into account. You can do a tabletop relocation test. You can do a push-up or a chair test, which means the patient is standing up and pushing his, himself up or his body weight up from the chair or from the table. And you need to do some clinical screenings for hyperlexity and instability and, and another kind of instability. And the most common reason for elbow or lateral elbow pain without having some pathologies on the elbow itself is uh, the cervical spine. So you should screen a, the cervical spine for um, C5 to C7 and any symptoms there. If you're trained in ultrasound, you, you should do an ultrasound of the extensor group. So in Germany, this is very common. I think in the United States and Canada, there's a radiologist doing it. In Germany, the orthopedic doctors doing it by themselves. Um, so you get a, a good feeling for the patient and you can see if there's a, just a, some swelling in the tissue or if there's edema or is there calcification for chronic degeneration. Or is, that, is there an intertendinous or partial tear of the extensor group? So you can decide about how, how sure you are about the conservative treatment without doing some special diagnostics except ultrasound. Over the time, you should add an uh, um, uh, X-ray. So in 25% of the cases, you can see some calcifications around the extensor insertion. But the, the problem is there is no way to say that it's necessary to have them or if, if it's there it's not a prognostic factor for having pain there and it's more or less in my hand it's just rule out uh, pathologies like a 
OD or a panor or it's a osteoarthritis or instability, but it's not the diagnostic of the first row in my You can do an MRI. This is my uh, way to um, look at the elbow if I want to operate on it because it's taking lots of time or the patient is very painful. And you can decide if there is a mild tendinosis, a tendinosis or a low-grade tear, which means it's just 20% of the tendon. If there's a moderate lesion, about 20 to 80% with a focal disruption, or if there's a severe or high-grade partial or full thickness tear, with a fluid filled gap or over 80% of ten, uh, tendon. If you want to treat, there's the first uh, consensus of conservative treatment. Uh, it takes time, up to years. And this is kind of second opinion. If you're a surgeon, if you've got a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So maybe we should talk about the, some screws and nails, not only the operative nail, but the conservative screws. And I want to talk about a little bit of evidence treatment. So the first thing we can give the patient or we can help the patient in acute pain is acute pain treatment with pain reduction, taking some pills. So NSIDs are good for the short term, but they are not long term improving. That's a very... Um, Hard to think about because if you don't take a pill, it's not working. So overall, after one year, it's better to have physiotherapy than to have uh, injection with cortisone or with or without NSID. So it's the recommendation to do it just in the acute setting, but not for long. You can add physiotherapy for your patient. In Germany, this is a very common thing. In the United States, you just get a kind of explanation what you do in Germany, you get uh, a trainer at your side, a physiotherapist who is showing you six to 12 times what to do and that you're doing it right. And we recommending a combination of manual therapy, friction, stretching and range of motion training. But there's no way to show that one of these is better than the others. It's just, I think the combination you need to do. You can do an extracorporeal shockwave therapy There are many studies out there. Most of the studies show a kind of improvement. Uh, most of the studies take three times, three sessions uh, with 2,000 uh, pulses per session. Um, there is no difference in the clinical uh, outcome between focused or radiant shockwave therapy. So it's no matter what you do, it's just you, to, you need to do it uh, three times and 2,000 times per session, and then you get a good patient. Um, you can do think about uh, splinting or orthotics, so a cast with especially including the wrist is an, is an option for acute pain, but I don't think it's very often used in Germany. Then you can use some orthotics like uh, this uh, wrist bandage and the elbow bandage with a proximal forearm strap, which is working quite good. If the patient tolerates the pressure of the Velcro, And you can add some kinesio tape in bright colors on the patient, which works for at least the first six weeks. You can do corticoid infiltrations. That's a special topic for me because I don't like them. If you do it, it's a single shot procedure because multiple shots show, uh, are shown to be more damaging the tendon than helping the patient. Although there is a short clinical relief, the patients get worse in long-term follow-up. So if you want to do an operation on the elbow, you just add, have to add multiple injections with cortisone. So you get an odds ratio of 5.6 uh, for the operation after injections. If you do it, do it with an ultrasound guided injection so you get your cortisone where you want it, not where, not where, where it shouldn't be. If you keep thinking about corticoid injections, we've got good numbers that if you're putting in more than three or more of the cortisone injections into the tendon, that there's that this is one risk factors for operative revision after operative treatment. So three shots, the gender, the age, and obesity show the risk factors for the patient. So if you want to add risk for the patient, you just need to infiltrate him. Are there other injections on the market? Yes, there are. There are lots of uh, medications on the, on the market. So you can add polydocanol, 
can like if you're doing some um, varicosis, you can add draw mail, which is so, just something like um, plant-based. You get PRP, you get ABI, you get hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid. You can add Botox just for the reduction of the pain. You can add prolotherapy, which is a, a sugar you, you add in the tendon and then it's getting better, maybe. And there's uh, lots of uh, studies out there. So we've got good evidence. And the problem is we've got about uh, 150 studies on infiltrations and the agents of um, infiltrations in the last nine years with many variants, no clean studies with evidence of the superiority of one agent with agent uh, versus another. So it doesn't seem to matter which agent you infiltrate. The only point every paper works out, every paper works out is that corticoid infiltrations are always worse in the long term than any other injection. So maybe you just should switch to another injection. I want to get, uh, I, I want to mark out the polytocanol infiltrations. So this is in English, and it's just reducing the new vessels and it shows good uh, short to long term or, or midterm results. Although the most of the studies are done on Achilles tendon or um, other tendinopathies, but it, it's working on the elbow too. Acupuncture. Is it necessary that you add a Chinese guy to your group so he can do uh, acupuncture for healing tennis elbow? There are very rare studies and there's only a short term follow up and there are very indifferent results. So it's not clearly recommended to do acupuncture because it's necessary to get it for getting the patient healed. In Germany, we've got some tradition about radiotherapy. So there's a, a huge German literature review from 1923 to 2015. It's around about 100 years of radiotherapy. And the average results of, results of these studies show in half of the patients a complete and in another 30% a partial remission and in 16% no pain relief. So 80% of the patients get better with radiotherapy after one to three years. But if you remember my uh, introduction using words, it's about 75% of the patient getting without operation of conservative treatment better if you just wait. So it's more or less the same number. So there is no uh, RCT and it's a very short follow-up. It's not necessary or it's not um, recommended to add radiotherapy to your patient. We can do magnetic field therapy. So there are three reviews uh, with the last paper reviewed from 2013. So it's only old data which show no defect. We've got three randomized controlled trials which show as well as uh, good as not good data. And we've got one case series from 2017 with, with the first uh, published positive effect in the last years. So maybe we will hear from this group a little bit more. In you can add some other physical therapy. So it's cryo, it's uh, electrotherapy or ultrasound therapy or heat tape therapy. So someone seems to believe that it's necessary or it's better to heat the elbow, although there's some kind of inflammation. It seems to be good if it's getting warmer. Um, the other things are every therapy I show you on this um, PowerPoint. Um, there is no evidence for one of uh, from one of these getting superior here about the others. So there is no recommendation as a single measure of any of these physical therapy agents. Oxygen therapy is another possible solution, but right now there is no suitable suitable study out there showing uh, any results for oxygen therapy and epicondylitis. Uh, Attendants seem to work. The, one of the most important things to get better is to change your habits. It's no matter if you're obese and you just try to lose weight or if you have elbow pain and you just try to adapt your work and lifestyle so you can add a, a training session and changing your grip or at least the strength of the, um, the tennis elbow uh, of the tennis uh, racket. So if it's a hard racket, you should switch to a soft uh, wooden racket, which is just better for the impact. Or you can just uh, add a vertical mouse to your working place or a special 
keyboard or a special chair to get a good position in front of your uh, computer. So maybe in some future times we can do Celsims or MMP inhibitors, which are working for us and just telling the patient we are not ready, but we are serving it. And you are just the next one getting your pain free. And maybe it will work with the stem cells if, you, if we wait a little bit more longer. This is my own therapy algorithm. If the patient just comes in my outpatient clinic, at the um, time zero, there's some diagnostics, so I try to make a good clinical diagnostic. I'm doing an ultrasound and I'm adding an X-ray. Then I'm talking about uh, therapy, so it's load reduction, recreation, and sports or core training. It's a, a pain medication, it's physiotherapy for training with the patient. Um, I'm at a kinesio tape or I prescribe orthosis if the patient is just telling me that he will bear it. And I give detailed information about the natural course of epicondylitis and that it's not necessary to operate on it in the first line. So we've got time and the patient is taking his time too. After three months, I'm looking again at the patient. If it's still painful, I add my personal way an, an autologous blood injection. So if the patient wants to get it, he gets after three months an injection and I just prescribe the MRI so that he MRI and we can talk about the extent of the extension lesion. So this only just because if conservative treatment doesn't work. So if we think about why it doesn't it work and how can we produce a reliable way of finding out which one, we have to talk about the anatomy of the extensors. There's a very small insertion, about five cent big, with all the main muscles of the extensor group. Uh, insert in, in, on the small insertional side. We've got a very close uh, rela relation between the extensor tendons and the ligaments below or in the capsule. So if there's a joint problem, it's always an extensor problem too. We have a possible pain trigger if you've got a big plica, which is just um, with, uh, in between the humeral capitulum and the radial head, and maybe aching. You can add an arthroscopy and just resect the plica, which can be done without any further comp uh, commitments of the, the, the pain. So this is the plica and the pain tr uh, trigger because it's not only the plica itself, but it's contra lesions below this plica which can make pain or just a sign of instability which can create. And the next lesion we have to talk about is a contra lesion. So it's maybe a loose body or it's a OD or a contra lesion like shown in the middle or maybe it's arthritis of the joint with a destructed joint. They sometimes produce um, symptoms like lateral epicondylitis without being an LE. From inside to the outside, um, the first thing, the outside, there's a pain in the capsule. Um, the capsule is uh, very high infiltrated by nerves. So there's the, the radialis, the medialis, and the ulnaris nerve, um, which are in, uh, infiltrating the capsule and making pain or leading to pain symptoms. And we've got these um, sensors, the Pacini and Kerber's uh, bodies, um, Golgi tendon apparatus and Ruffini's end virgins, which are uh, feeling the tension of the ligaments and uh, transmitting pain as well. We do use the CRAP classification, which is an acronym for chronic radial atrogenic pain classification, which means it's a classification for chronic persistent pain. And it's uh, the idea that is seldomly uh, isolated tendopathy if the chronic pain is persisting longer than six to 12 months. So we are looking for lesions like the joint triggers I showed before in the radial elbow pain. We're looking for instability triggers uh, which is triggering radial elbow pain, and it's a, cl a descriptive classification. You can see the German version of the um, paper we published. It's talking about the extensor defect on the MRI, so it's an ABC for partial intratendinous, complete partial or complete rupture. 
or tear of the common extends the origin. We are looking for stability clinically and atroscopically. So we graduating from stable to uh, dislocating. And we're looking at the concomitant pathologies like uh, osteophytes, plica, or chondral defects. We do not only use it for classification, but we try to find out that there is, if there's a A1, so it's an intratendinous lesion without anything else, uh, you can do it with a scope or do nothing. And um, if it, it's a complete rupture with a, a cross instability of the elbow, you need to do a LOCL reconstruction, refixation of the extensive group. To make it just a little bit more lively, I will show three different examples. The first one is a debridement patient. So he has a stable elbow, just a small lesion of the extensive group, and then you can do an atroscopic or an open debridement. I would uh, copy one because you can debride the COE quite easily without any danger to the patient. And the other way is you can do a debridement with refixation of the extensor or maybe just a debridement and release of the extensor group. It's the so-called operation according to Homer, and modified to the, with a refixation of the tendon. Or you can do a refixation without uh, not knots, so it's a knotless oil suturing, in this case by Arthrex, showing the refixation of the group without um, having a very big incision for the patient. No. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the third is a minor instability. Arigoni published this first. We are thinking about this about the last maybe 20 years when my, uh, my boss here in the clinic thought about an extensive overload and uh, maybe resulting instability because below the extensors there's always the LOCL and if it's gone, you have a persistent atraumatic PLRI. The subluxation of PLRI results out of a LOCL insufficiency. So if you're doing a supination and axial stress and then or axial load and then the movement with this, then you can get a click and then it's a positive instability in the PLRI. Then we've got uh, an unstable patient with an extensor lesion. So this is what we call a crab C3. And you see this on the atroscopic pictures. And in the MRI, there's lots of rupture of the extensor and the ligament, and there's an unstable elbow. And that's what we would recommend. The debridement, but the reconstruction of the edu cell, we use a triceps transplant. You can use gracilis or a palmaris longus if you like to. We just um, steal the tri uh, strip of the triceps out of the, the big triceps tendon, just seven centimeters long, but only seven millimeters in, in the bits. So it's always there, even in a small woman. And then we add it in the anatomic uh, way to refixate it and reconstruct the LOCL and just refixate the extensors on the, on the epicondyle and the LOC. So this is the complete recommendation and that's what I want to tell you. You can have uh, lots of various patients with the symptoms of tennis elbow and you need a kind of algorithm because I don't think everyone is treated by the same easy way, just you can get better if you try to adapt your treatment to the patient. So the take home message for you today is the tennis elbow is most often a self-limiting uh, disease, uh, which is uh, healing good with conservative treatment or even just with, with just waiting. And there is a In my hand, a high number of suspicion or suspicion for PLRI or uh, subclinical PLRI in chronic uh, persisting lateral elbow pain. There has to be a partial tear of the tendon or a subclinical PLRI because all the other patients with without these structural lesions don't stay as a tennis arm for longer time. So if there's some, some persisting pain, I would recommend a clinical or atroscopic Typical testing for instability, at least if you want to get to an operation, I do an atroscopic testing. 
and then I can do a debridement if there's a stable elbow or I can do a refixation or a ligament reconstruction if it's an unstable elbow. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer your questions. But I, I think I know it's a quite um, progressive way and it's not the, the, the most common way, but maybe it's a good way to, to add from every world what you want to get. Thank you, Christian, for yet another brilliant lecture from your side. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, do you think there's a role for a percutaneous release in resistant cases? Um, the, the isolated percutaneous release is in Germany very uncommon because the, the, the studies say it's not that bad, but it's the worst outcome. If you try to operate, it's easier to do it by scope or open. And the isolated percutaneous attempt is not as good as the other options so we don't do it very often but if you just want to have it in an outpatient and you're good in it and doing it by ultrasound so maybe why not hmm. and do you think there's a risk for a plra instability by doing a percutaneous release for sure that's the reason why i don't do it <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for that uh christian uh, dr sentil is also in our zoom room sentil is a staff orthopedic surgeon yeah. based in uh, Texas, United States. Uh, send the new questions to Christian. Hey, Christian. Uh, this is a very frustrating condition we see in the clinic. A lot of patients want a quick clearly relief. Um, so, uh, what, how often do you end up operating on these patients in your practice? Like what percentage of the patients, your patients end up with surgery, roughly? Roughly, it's about 10%. It's really the numbers, you, you know. Most of the patients, I can talk out of it because it's just taking them time. And I tell them that it's taking time after operation too. And then they want mm -hmm. to work still with a little bit of pain. And so they, they don't want to wait after operation. They just go on. And if it's not that painful, they can go on. I don't get them out of work. I just say, if it's possible, work on. And then it's taking its time. And so only about 10 to 15% maybe stay for operation after half a year or a year. But I add an MRI after three months to get it more easily for the patient to show there is no big lesion or there is a big lesion we should operate earlier. And uh, when you also operate on the the MRI. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. When you operate, how yeah. often do you find a PLRA uh, in your patients, you know? And how often do you have to do something for the PLRA? I think I do about half my patients, I do a LSUL reconstruction because I'm waiting that long. I believe that that's most of the tennis elbows. Wait, if you're waiting a year for a tennis elbow operation, then it's not tennis elbow, then it's instability in, in a quite big number. All the other guys are getting good within a year. And so you have a high number of, of patients having a PLRI or a mild PLRI. So I, I do often the, the reconstruction or the refixation or the reefing of the LUCL or, at least, or even the, the triceps reconstruction. So when you use a triceps reconstruction, what's yes. your preferred method of fixation on the humeral side and what's it on the uh, on the ulnar side, that is on the supinated crest? On the ulnar side, I just put in a, a button. It's from Arthrex. It's a biceps button from the distal biceps tendon. The so inner discus button. Uh -huh. To hang it up there. And then I use in a tenodesis screw for the humeral side just to get tension. Okay. Uh -huh. You hang it up right now and then you tension it on the humeral side and it's easier with the tenodesis screw to, to, to add a tension. I, I used and to the, do two buttons, but the, the second uh, button is, is not a big problem, but it's, um, I think it's better with the tenodesis screw because there is no synovia fluid running in the channel in the humeral side. Okay. Uh -huh. So, any technical tips when you do the LUCL, like arm position, graph length, all those things? Well, um, the arm position for me, when I fix it, or if when I uh, uh, screw in my screw, it's about 70 degrees of flexion. But I, mm -hmm. I believe it's the, the best way is to put it uh, as, as short as possible. So you, uh, not, not the length, uh, it should be a very tight reconstruction because it's loosening afterwards a little bit. So you, you shouldn't do it loose before or within the operation room, but afterwards it will lose a little bit. So you do it as tight as possible. And if you're doing six to seven centimeters of graft, taking it out, it's always long enough. And you just have to lengthen it after you hang it up on the ulnar side, you just uh, do the 
the, 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 the sutures on the humeral side of the ligament. So you can just lengthen it out afterwards. So it's not even take it longer and then make it shorter. Uh-huh. And uh, I've seen the Dennis Alboy in a lot of healthcare professionals. What's your experience and uh, how hard it is to treat them, you know, especially surgeons, anesthesiologists, proceduralists. Mm-hmm. What's your experience yeah. with it? I don't treat surgeons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I don't do any surgeon, especially when we are talking about and everyone, every sort, every orthopedic surgeon I know had a tennis elbow for some time and no one was operated on. That's a very interesting number because everyone operates on tennis elbow, but no one would have to be <laughs> operated on his own one. Everyone is taking his time and it's getting good in most of the patients, even uh, especially in the orthopedic surgeons I know. But we're discussing this a lot because everyone has sometimes a little bit of tennis elbow and everyone is getting out of it. And nurses, I, I think it's different. Yeah? But maybe it's the gender and they have more laxity and they have more prob- problems with the instability for me. Yeah? But the, the, the classical, I hammer too much. So the acute tennis elbow, this is going away after a few months if you take your time. So that's the surgeon problem. The nurses have a lot more loads and heavy patients. So I think they've got a, a, a higher risk for getting an operation than an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, that's mm-hmm. uh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think any, I have any more questions. Sit there, show it to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Christian. And just one point that I want to add is, uh, like you mentioned, if the orthopedic surgeon, that's a very common uh, measure to know the utility of a procedure. If an orthopedic surgeon himself undergoes that, a common debate is a high tibial osteotomy versus a unicompartmental knee. And the question is yeah. asked to whether the orthopedic surgeon himself, or which procedure will he choose? So the, most of the orthopedic surgeons choose a high tibial osteotomy. So that yeah. is one good measure to know the, success, I mean, the utility of a procedure. So thank you, Senthil and Christian for enlightening that. And I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Fantastic lecture okay. as usual, Christian. And I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining. You're very welcome. Thank you again. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Christian. Have a good day. Thank you, Dave. Take care.